A very warm welcome to this online session. We're delighted that people have sacrificed their lunch hour to join us for this conversation. And it's a particular pleasure and indeed honor for me to be able to be speaking to Dr. Sarah Caddy, Senior Research Fellow in this college. This is the first of our webinars, and therefore we're not quite sure how difficult the, um, the technology is going to be. And if you're anything like me, you'll understand that uh, these technologies can be a bit alarming, but we hope that all will go smoothly. And I'll just run through the order of proceedings for you before I begin to um, embark on a discussion with Sarah. Basically, the, the format of the next hour or so is that Sarah and I will be talking together for about half an hour. That should give you some time to formulate any thoughts you have, any responses, any questions. And you'll see, I hope, that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. In the period following the conversation between the two of us, we'll be taking questions from our audience. And there's well over 100 of you out there. and We're delighted that you're there. So I will relay those questions and we'll see where it goes from there. So we shall be hoping that as many of you as possible will be involved in that discussion. And I should also say that we're recording this event and it'll be available to view again later if you want to see it again. So once again, thank you and enormous thanks to Sarah for agreeing to do this conversation. So without more ado, Sarah, let's, let's start in. And obviously the starting point most people will be interested in is how you actually became involved in working around the coronavirus and related medical and biological questions. So could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So my main research, what I'm not involved in the outbreak, is to do with viruses and also antibodies. So viruses are something I've studied for about 10 years now. Um, so through my PhD and through my junior research fellowship at Magdalen. Um, but I don't work on coronaviruses. I've been um, working on a whole number of different viruses that have some similarities. But there's a sort of a set of skills that virologists develop that you can apply to lots of the different viruses as well. Um, so it was back in March as I was watching sort of the news unfold about um, the coronavirus getting closer and closer and you know, cases starting popping up in the UK. And I realised I wanted to do something that would be valuable, that could help. I wanted to use my, um, I guess, my technical skills um, in the most useful way. Um, and... The, the best way I thought for myself to do that was to get involved in testing of people. Um, so um, actually analysing samples from humans to see whether they have the coronavirus or not. So some of this also has to do with your work in um, Sierra Leone in relation to the Ebola outbreak, is that right? And could you tell us a bit about how, how that helped to shape your, your discernment of what was going on and your sense of what needed doing in research terms? No, absolutely. So the Ebola outbreak, 2014-2016, um, um, required a lot of uh, volunteers again to do testing for the Ebola virus. Um, and so I finished my PhD um, in April 2015 and the following week actually I volunteered to go out to Sierra Leone um, to work in a lab um, that was receiving blood samples from um, people with suspect Ebola virus and we were just running a, a standard test it's called a quantitative PCR test or qPCR um, and I'd done this test hundreds of times during my PhD um, but in my PhD I was specifically looking for dog viruses so so quite a different um, question but exactly the same technique um, so in Sierra Leone um, I said I've I volunteered to go out to be part of a larger team to um, to run the laboratories they had out there. Now, um, it isn't very widely known, but actually the UK government funded three different laboratories in Sierra Leone, and each one of them were manned by so around 10 um, staff that um, we had periods of deployment. So we'd spend five weeks out there and then come back to the UK. Um, and basically the, the test, the qPCR test for Ebola is exactly the same for coronaviruses. So um, 
the the organization that's been um, running the tests in the UK is called Public Health England and indeed it was Public Health England organized the Sierra Leone tests so as a going back to March time um, this year when everything started kicking off in the UK you know I wrote to Public Health England and said look I want to help what can I do and they sort of welcomed me with open arms and um, a couple of days later I was in their, their labs um, on, in Addenbrooke, so level six of Addenbrooke's, um, and basically just being a pair of hands. Now the test is relatively straightforward to run, but there are lots of different steps. Um, and so I was kind of just a small cog in this massive, massive machine that was, was uh, running for the testing. Um, and I should say that the labs um, at Addenbrooke's here, they, they routinely test um, human samples for other viruses, so influenza and things like that. And they normally deal with about 50 samples a day. And then suddenly back in March, they were dealing with 500 plus samples a day. So they, they suddenly had um, real capacity issues. And that's the point where I sort of volunteered my time, but it became very apparent very quickly that it wasn't actually a lack of people, it was lack of, of space, Base, it was lack of reagents, it was lack of all the, the machines that we need to do this. So it became clear that the problem was much, much bigger than just needing bodies on the ground, essentially. So there'd been some real learning from the, the Ebola experience at national and international level, as well as for you. Absolutely. Yes, and because there was, a, as I said, there was, there was many of us that volunteered out in Sierra Leone, and many of these same people have been sort of in very similar capacities. Yeah. Um, back in the UK. So yeah, we did learn a lot and lots of the technologies and things that were used in Sierra Leone um, have been you know, directly applicable in this outbreak. Because sometimes at the moment, it's, it's almost as if um, this pandemic is seen by many people as coming almost from nowhere, whereas actually there's been a lot of prediction, there's been a lot of experience accumulating. And the challenge has been, I suppose, twofold. One, to um, actually <clears throat> get, get the material response there on the ground in, in this country. And the other is to, uh, well, to keep alive that sense that this is not, in general terms, not the kind of problem that's going to go away in a hurry. People have been saying, we've almost been waiting for a pandemic outbreak of this kind. Is that is that fair? No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, virologists the world over know that, you know, one of the fascinating things about viruses is they, they can seemingly appear um, out of nowhere, but, um, Often they, they come from either an animal host or it's to do with um, changes in um, interactions between humans and animals that, that allow these viruses to suddenly infect more people. Um, and there's, there's been hundreds of examples over the last sort of, 56 years of viruses jumping um, between a species. But obviously this is the this is the example that's created the biggest impact. It's affected the most people. Um, so I think, yeah, it's very fair to say that people have been expecting something like this, but unfortunately um, it's happened so much faster, so much bigger than I think most people could have predicted. So getting back to the science for a moment, um, there's been work that's been done and still going on with the um, genomics team. So could you explain a bit about how, how work in genomics relates to uh, tracing and testing in, in this context? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I guess following the timeline of my, my involvement in this outbreak, um, as I said, I started off with it involved in the testing, but as it became clear that it was, wasn't a lack of volunteers, it was um, other issues, um, I switched um, direction slightly to start working on full genome sequencing of the virus. And this has been with Professor Ian Goodfellow and his team over in virology. And I should say that Professor Ian Goodfellow is my PhD supervisor. Um, so someone I knew very well already. And he had actually set up a very similar sequencing system for Ebola in Sierra Leone. So I think it was a surprise to us all to suddenly be using exactly the same technology, but in Addenbrooke's. Um, and essentially the point of genomics or full virus genome sequencing is to um, actually look at the entire sequence of the virus. So whereas the normal testing, the qPCR testing just says yes or no um, with, a, with a bit more information about how much virus is, it doesn't tell us anything about 
what kind of virus it is, where it might have come from. Whereas if we look at the entire sequence, we can have a look to see, is it similar to the person over there or the, the, the patient we had last week or um, someone from Italy? Um, so that genomics detail gives us a bit more information about how the virus is spreading through a population. Um, so yet yeah, with Professor Ian Giffel's team, um, they are still, the work's still ongoing and basically every positive human sample that gets tested by Public Health England, and that's in the, in this region, um, so east of England, um, it can then has the potential to be tested or to be screened for the full genome sequence. So the aim has been to do every single patient at Addenbrooke's um, and then a select number of cases from, from other local hospitals. Um, and as I understand, the, the number of sequences that the Goodfellow team have done so far is, is over a thousand, possibly quite a few more by now. So it's, it's extremely impressive um, in terms of how fast technology has um, developed. Um, and I guess I should say that actually the genomics going on in Cambridge is part of a much wider national effort. Um, so it's called the COVID Genomics UK Consortium. And there are now groups, I believe, in around um, 12 different locations in the UK. Some of these are Public Health England places, some of these academic research institutes, and each centre is doing this full genome sequencing of, of virus isolates. And all together in the UK, um, current total is around 20,000 genomes in the virus, um, which puts us at the number one spot worldwide for virus genome sequencing. So this is, this is a great place to be. It definitely gives us a lot of information about how the virus is spreading. Uh, but it's also really important because it allows us to um, analyze whether the virus is changing at all um, and that's important for a couple of different reasons um, one is we want to make sure that the the standard test we're doing the PCR test uh, will pick up the virus as it changes and we can do that by looking at the sequence to make sure there's no mutations arising in the site where the um, test is specifically looking at um, but it's also important for potentially drug interactions and vaccine developments um, we can start to say you know, is the virus going to mutate away from any viruses or any, oh, sorry, any vaccines or any particular drugs that are being explored as, as therapy at the moment. So this is very much work with a long-term significance. Yes, absolutely. Can you say a little bit more about the question of mutation? People will read reports in the paper saying oh, it's a virus which continues to mutate and they might um, react with a bit of panic to that. No, absolutely. That no, that's, <laughs> um, so, so the virus is um, quite a big virus. So viruses kind of come in two flavours normally. They can either have a DNA genome so DNA like that genome we have, or they can have an RNA genome. And when we're talking about um, how proteins are made, the, sort of the normal route is DNA to RNA to protein. Um, but the RNA genome, so a little bit more, um, it can be a little bit more variable. Um, and these are viruses that typically um, cause sudden acute infection. So Ebola is and has an RNA genome as well. And the, the thing is that viruses do, do slowly change over time. Um, and a lot of work has been looked to see how fast the coronavirus is changing. Um, and I guess the good news is it doesn't change as fast as flu. So we know that flu changes quite rapidly and it's one of the reasons we have to change the vaccine every single year to update um, the vaccine to make sure new strains are included. But the latest data suggests that the coronavirus um, changes about half the rate um, of flu. So that's, that's reassuring. Um, but I, yeah, I guess I should say that lots of these changes in the, in the virus genome, um, they don't do anything at all. It's simply just a slight error that will just get overlooked. It doesn't make the virus any worse, doesn't make it any better. Um, and if we look at the virus between patients, so if we focus on the Addenbrooke situation here in Cambridge, um, most viruses are only eight 
um, eight nucleotides or basically eight single point differences between patients. And the virus itself has 30,000 nucleotides. So 30,000 to eight, you know, it's, it's not, a, not a major concern, but it's something that obviously um, virologists across the world keeping a very close eye on to make sure we're not getting new changes that, that could affect the way we test or the way we treat the virus. Uh, the focus of a lot of your work has been antibodies, I think. Is that right? That's so right. Tell us a bit about um, about that and how, what sort of perspective that gives you on, on the likelihood of things developing for the better in the next 12 months or so. No, absolutely. So yes, as um, my research before this outbreak was, was centering on how viruses um, interact with antibodies. So just for a quick recap, um, antibodies are proteins produced by our immune response. So they're made by B cells and they function to bind to the virus and kind of act as little flags to say to the rest of the immune response, destroy the virus. You know, this is something we don't want. So Antibodies are very, very important, um, but they are actually only a, one component of the immune response to any virus um, or any infection. Um, they're just the point that they're the easily measurable um, aspect because you can take a blood sample um, and then look specifically for these tiny little proteins. So there's been a lot of interest about testing for antibodies and what that could mean. Um, and testing for antibodies will basically give a good indication of whether you've had the virus in the past. So whereas the qPCR test I mentioned at the beginning, which is the test they're doing in the hospital, that says, can we find the virus right now? Um, but there's obviously quite a narrow window where that test will be positive. It's maybe around uh, a week to 10 days in a, in a healthy a previously healthy person but the antibody test you would hope it would tell you'd had the virus for weeks if not months if not years after you had it so it's very useful for looking at the virus spread through a population um, so that's that's something that's a lot of interest in antibody testing for that reason um, but another thing we, we're interested in antibodies is we want to say we want to be able to say if you have a particular antibody response, does that mean you're protected? You won't get the virus a second time? And those are kind of two different questions really, because one just says, yes, you've had the virus in the past. The other one says, will you get it again in the future? And actually the will you get it again in the future question is one we don't know much about yet. Um, it's relatively easy to say, yes, we've got an antibody against the virus, but we don't know whether that's actually going to be useful um, in the face of another outbreak, another exposure. Right. So the question, I suppose, that is very much at the forefront of people's minds is about vaccine development and the rate of vaccine development. Any news from the front line on this? <laughs> I know it's not the main thing, but what do you pick up? I mean, it's, it's, it's been incredible to witness the speed at which new vaccines or new candidate vaccines are um, appearing in the press and sort of in the scientific literature, um, looking at the list of clinical trials that are recorded, there's, there's um, at least 60 going on, if not more, um, certainly many more planned. Um, I believe at present there are sort of around seven or eight trials where humans are getting injected with, with different vaccine options, uh, but they're all pretty early stages at the moment. So. Um, just to, to quickly explain how vaccine development works. Um, normally you start with preclinical vaccine tests where that generally means you're testing it on animals. So whether it's mice or whether it's monkeys, you're saying, do they, do they show a protective immune response? And then the step after that is to move into humans and they're called phase one clinical trials. And that's generally a small group of humans. And you're just asking, is the vaccine safe? Or does it cause any kind of side effects that would be worrying? Um, and then you move up into phase two, um, where it's generally bigger groups of people. Um, again, starting to ask, do they develop an immune response? Are they making antibodies that might be useful? Um, and then phase three, which is the kind of the ultimate phase we want to get to as quick as possible. That's when we say, are the people that get the vaccine versus people that get the placebo, um, are they better protected? And 
at the moment there are no phase three clinical trials of the vaccine ongoing that I'm aware of. Um, and that's that's the really critical stage basically because there's no point having a vaccine that's safe but actually doesn't protect you <laughs> so it's there's a there's a lot of questions still to sort of to work through but the whole speed at which the vaccine feels working is as i said it, it is quite quite incredible it's normally takes a good 10 years from um the beginning of the trial of a vaccine to actually producing a vaccine and yet the current estimates are hopefully sort of a year to 18 months away before we get a vaccine that will be available to sort of a limited set of the population. So does that mean we're already in phase one and two of the sort of trials you, you mentioned? Exactly, exactly. So there's um there's a trial at Oxford which has been very well publicised um, and they're, they're doing phase one trials, they're recruiting very quickly for that. Um, but there are other trials across the country which will be beginning soon as well. And then of course, there's, there's plenty of international efforts. So there are quite a few trials in China, um, a, a couple in the States, they got off the ground really quickly. So there's, I think it's, there's a lot of potential. And I think it's really exciting to see all these different approaches being used because um, each vaccine company has their own kind of strategy, their own way to try and induce the new response. And we, we can't say at the moment which one's actually going to be best, but surely having multiple options has got to be sort of the best way to look at this. Do you feel that international cooperation is, is really working well on this? I mean, at, at the moment it really seems so. I mean, there's some, certainly some really big multinational um, organizations that are overseeing things and providing sort of funding sources. And so that's really encouraging. I think there is, yeah, there's a very, very good international effort. And I just hope that continues as much as possible. Hmm. You've talked a little bit about um, the virus in animals and the, the parallels there. Um, and I believe it's right to say that there's there's actually no evidence of animals spreading the virus back to humans at the moment, is that right? That is correct, yes. So you yes. don't have to worry about pets. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it it's, has been a big concern for many pet owners um, mm. and for multiple reasons. M many pet owners have been worried that they could make their animals sick um, or people worried that pets could make them sick. But the evidence at the moment suggests that neither of those things um, happen in any significant amount whatsoever. Um, so as a, a small animal veterinarian, which is I was <laughs> before my sort of uh, uh, transition into being a virologist, um, mm. has meant that obviously cats and dogs are something that I've studied in the past. As I mentioned, my PhD was looking at dog viruses. Mm. And so a question that has arisen is, well, can this virus infect dogs and cats and or other species? Um, and there's been a couple of different studies looking at this. Um, so one of, well, one option is actually experimentally infect animals. So take animals in the lab and expose them to high doses of the virus. And interestingly, it's been found that cats can become infected by the virus, but I would argue that this is an experimental situation. The, the amount of virus they're getting doesn't actually reflect what your pet cat sleeping on your bed might be exposed to. Um, and certainly there hasn't been um, a sudden influx of, of cat cases with these odd respiratory signs. There's been maybe a handful of cases reported worldwide where the cat you know, was coughing a little bit or had a bit of difficulty breathing. But actually it's important for cat owners to be aware that cats can have loads of different reasons why they might show clinical signs like that. And it's, it's extremely unlikely to be um, the COVID-19. So I want, yeah, I want to, to reassure pet owners out there that actually cats very, very, or basically show no evidence of getting sick from this virus, but obviously there's lots of research ongoing on this area, so screening animals to make sure that they're not acting as um, any kind of silent transmitters of the virus. I mean, that does come back to the, the very broad question of means of transmission, doesn't it? Yes. And I wonder if you could give us a bit of a sketch of where the thinking is at the moment on you know, the most high-risk means of transmission. It seems we've, we've come round to talking about droplets rather than surfaces as the, the primary risk here. 
Yes, again, as I understand, it's it's obviously close contact, human to human, that's going to be the most the most high risk, and that's kind of where all of the control measures are focused on. So we are say you know, the government saying this two meter distance from other people. You know, there's there's talk about or there's discussions of, of wearing face masks, um, and that is all related to the fact that you know spread is more likely um to be spread you know, by coughing by via droplets as you said um in the air as opposed to um solid objects that someone might have contacted in the past but i mean again both are theoretically possible and i don't think we really know enough to say you know even how long a virus can survive on some of these surfaces and um, as for face masks have you got a view <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. I mean, again, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on this. I think um, in situations where social distancing isn't possible, it's got to be a sensible precaution. And it's not about just protecting yourself, it's protecting people you're with as well. So I think, um, I think it's a sensible thing to do if you are, if you do have to work in those situations. Um, but social distancing full stop, I think has got to be the absolute sort of most important point here. Sarah, we're coming to the end of our first bit of uh, this event. So I wonder if there's just anything you'd like to say by way of overview in terms of the timetable people are living with, what people might be able to expect in the next six months, say. I, I know it's, it's going to be just one view, but you're better placed than most of us. Just to give us a few um, unscripted thoughts on on that <laughs> that's a very good question um so there is concern that we're going to see what's called this second wave that's been talked about a lot um and again time's going to tell how important that is and whether we do see cases that start to um appear again as we move into potentially autumn and winter because we know for influenza for example that cases do peak over the winter and we don't know enough about this coronavirus to be sure whether it's going to behave the same but um, I think it's something that we need to be prepared for and certainly a lot of the um, policies and um, uh, testing facilities being put in place are getting ready in case we do have some some kind of second wave um, so I think we we all need to remain vigilant in this case it's I, I I'm sorry to say, I don't think it's going to suddenly just go away completely. Mm -hmm. We may be living with this with this virus for quite a long time. Um, but I very much hope that we can, as lockdown in the UK starts to sort of lift, we can slowly but surely return to some kind of normality. But it's it's not going to be the normal that we had mm -hmm. before. I'm 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 pretty sure about that. Which you know, which is which is a a very sad thing to have to say. Um, but again, we're kind of waiting for a vaccine at this stage and it's impossible to say whether we're going to get the perfect one and um, whether we're going to get one that's available to everybody as well. We're going to have to protect the most vulnerable people in the population first. Um, and I very much hope that that's something that is an option, as I said, in the next year to 18 months. Um, but drugs are something as well that might become more widely available once we know which drugs and which therapies are most effective and that's mm. that's an important uh, another line of research that's ongoing at the moment you talk about the protection of vulnerable groups and of course there's been a lot in the press about the apparent higher vulnerability of certain ethnic groups particularly mm. black and minority ethnic groups um what, what's the the science there so far it seems that we're not very sure yet what that might be no, absolutely. I mean, as as far as I know, there's there's lots of different possibilities that could be going on. And I don't think it's anywhere near as straightforward as simple genetics, human genetics. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I think it's a lot more about how different ethnicities um, live and work and interact with different people. Um, and I think, yeah, this is this is now going beyond my knowledge as a virologist, I'm afraid. Um, I think it's much more of a a sociological issue than otherwise, but I think it's something we need to keep an extremely close eye on. Sarah, thank you very much indeed for all of that. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions that have been generated, and um, I see we have quite a number lined up already. So thanks to those who've <laughs> sent in questions. I'll just um, 
look at my Q&A bar and see what's coming in. So, um, here's one question. Um, we've not been able to develop vaccines against the two coronaviruses that caused outbreaks of SARS in 2002 and of MERS in 2012. What features, if any, of the COVID-19 coronavirus suggest that the search for a vaccine may be more successful this time? That's from John Pettit. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I think economics is going to play a huge part here. I think the reasons we didn't get um, a vaccine for SARS and for MERS is because actually they weren't directly affecting so many people. I think, you know, the, the SARS outbreak um, back in 2003 or 2002, um, 800 people died, which seems insignificant in comparison to the current situation. So um, even though vaccines efforts did start in that in that instance, there just wasn't the impetus to carry them forwards. Um, and a similar situation with MERS, so this is the Middle Eastern respiratory um, coronavirus, it's quite geographically restricted. So in the UK, you know, again, there hasn't been a financial investment in trying to develop it. Um, so I'm hoping that actually, that, you know, we've learned some lessons from the SARS, potential SARS vaccine candidates and MERS vaccine candidates, but with the much increased research effort for SARS-CoV-2, um, I very much hope that we will sort of cross that hurdle and be able to actually come up with at least one, hopefully several vaccines that are effective. Thank you. Now we have um, a second question here from Tara Walsh, who asks, from your experience, how important is viral load? And do you think the current UK approach is placing enough emphasis on this analysis when assessing risk and its strategy and response? Okay, thank you. So viral load, um, so that means the amount of virus that's in a person. Um, and it's kind of related to um, how much virus it takes to infect a person. So what, what amount of virus do you need to come into contact with before you get actually infected? And we don't really know the answer to both of these questions from uh, at the moment basically we're not exactly sure how much virus you need to come to, you know, to potentially to eat or to inhale to become infected um there is evidence that the more virus you have inside you replicating so the higher the viral load the 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 worse the disease is but it's certainly not that simple um it's it's a large part to do with your immune response to the virus as well, whether you have a good immune response, whether you have a bad immune response, whether you have an over the top immune response, um, that impacts on how you, uh, what disease symptoms you get with this. So at the moment, yes, we, we don't really know enough about how virus load should be controlled. We're, we're basically the, the, most of the policies are working on just reducing exposure as much as possible because there's got to be a threshold over which um, you won't get in or under which you won't get infected basically so if we can reduce that down as low as possible then that's got to be a good thing. Thank you. Um, the next question is one that we've touched on briefly in our conversation it's from Dr Richard Seaburn who says how much is known about infection by touch as opposed to droplet inhalation for instance, bookshops are disinfecting or quarantining books that have been browsed. How long would the virus survive on a book cover or closed page? And of course, the $64,000 question, how soon can the libraries reopen? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so there have been some studies that have uh, been done in labs where they've put the virus particles onto different surfaces and then they've kind of waited to see how long the virus can survive. Um, so as I understand correctly for paper, um, they showed that after three hours, there weren't as many, well, there weren't virus particles that could cause infection again. Obviously this is a very artificial setting, um, but it does suggest that virus doesn't survive very well on paper. And I think that's probably good news for lots of us. Um, and we certainly know that the virus uh, doesn't, doesn't survive outside the body for very long um, and that's because of the way the the virus is structured so as i mentioned earlier it's got a little tiny rna genome or sort of sequence um, and that's wrapped in a protein shell um, and that's then covered by uh, what we call a lipid envelope now that just means like a fatty uh, uh, i guess a little coat um, that um, 
once that breaks down, the virus is no longer infectious. So that's what lots of these detergents and things and these various um, you know, sanitizers and hand, uh, hand washes, they're just aiming to break down this little uh, envelope, this little layer, and then that gets rid of the, the, the virus. Uh, but over time, the virus will decay by itself. Um, so I guess in a roundabout way, to get back to the library question, um, I think if people are able to maintain good hand hygiene, um, potentially wearing gloves, and I, I would very much hope that libraries would be something that could be open sooner rather than later, obviously ensuring social distancing is possible in sort of the larger places. Um, but certainly, um, obviously, and I'm hoping everyone with symptoms is staying away from the libraries. But yes, they study that showed that the virus doesn't survive longer than three hours on paper or tissue paper, I think, was, was quite encouraging. And I very much hope that is reflective of what the real world situation is like. Thanks. There are two questions from Dr. Ulrich Desselberger. And the first is this, there is at present uncertainty as to whether and to what extent a natural SARS coronavirus 2 infection elicits protective immunity in humans. What is known about the mechanistic correlates of protection against disease by this virus? Okay, so yes, that's a very important question. I touched on it earlier when talking about antibody testing, but correlates of protection, um, that's sort of a way of saying what aspects of someone's immune response um, are important for making sure they don't get the infection in the future. And at the moment, because this pandemic, this virus has only been around for sort of five months or so, we, we don't have enough information. We, you know, ideally what we need to do is go a year into the future and say, oh, look, these people's immune response looks like this and they didn't get the virus again. And then we can say, oh, well, those are the correlates of protection. Those are the, the tests we need to run. Um, but actually at the moment, we're kind of working on best guesses. So the antibodies is our, is our best guess. We're very much hoping that if you're making antibodies against the virus, then that would protect you from future infections. But I guess it's important to remember that there are lots of different types of antibodies. Um, without going into a big biology lesson, there's um, lots, <laughs> lots of different targets of the virus. The virus is quite a complicated particle, um, but there's also lots of different kinds of antibodies that interact with different cells um, and so there's a lot of again an international effort trying to work out which are the best antibodies which which part of the virus um, should they be recognizing and there's easy tests to run that and there's very complicated tests to run that um, and again here in Cambridge where um, there's lots of different assays being tried in different labs which is exciting to hear about at the moment and uh, we're actually working with a set of about um, a hundred different serum samples so blood samples and trying to put them into lots of different assays and working out which one of these is going to be most useful and most cost effective at the end of the day as well so um the, yeah there's a lot of research being done on this, this is a, a very very important question and i very much hope in the next few months perhaps if people start getting re-challenged with the virus, we might start to get some answers. Dr. Desselberger's second question is about bats. Bats have been identified as the most likely animal reservoir for zoonotic transmission of SARS coronavirus 2 to humans. Are there other animals known to be infected with bat coronavirus-like viruses? Are other mammals besides bats required as intermediate hosts for the infection of humans? So um, in brief, then yes, we do think there's probably um, what we call an intermediate host. So um, as, as Ulrich has rightly pointed out that um, bats, uh, there was a sequence from bats back in 2013 that was 96% identical to the coronavirus in humans now. Um, but 96% suggests that there was a common ancestor about 50 years ago. <laughs> so it's certainly not the same virus, but it's close enough. Um, so what is most likely to have happened is that the bats may have come into contact with another species and then humans have perhaps you know, encroached on the territory of other species or been hunting other species. Um, as to what that species is, the search is still on. Um, there was a little flurry of interest about potentially pangolins a couple of months ago. Um, so pangolins are a bit like scaly anteaters. Um, and they, they did find in pangolins, or I think it was just a handful of pangolins, a virus that looked quite similar, but it wasn't actually 
that similar when they kind of did a full genome sequence they showed actually it was quite different so pangolins are kind of now not the most likely explanation but the hunt is on there's lots of research teams again sort of scouring different animal populations across asia to see if any of them have a very similar virus or not thank you uh, two more questions from tara walsh the first is do the genome sequencing results you've obtained differ from the genome sequencing first done on covid19 virus released at the start of january 2020 so we can we can trace all of the um virus sequences in the uk or in, in cambridge in particular um you know they all have a common ancestor with the the virus um that was first isolated in in china back at sort of the very late um 2019 um as i said earlier the they don't differ that much the virus isn't mutating very fast which is obviously good news um so we can with some um degree of confidence say how uh, where the virus might have come from a particular place in the uk so with a particular hospital particular care home but actually there isn't that much variation to really play with so actually epidemiology has to come into play as well and by that i mean we have to look at where the infected person has been who they've been in contact with and so it's kind of two pieces of information that are, are important for tracing um, and I think mean, one thing I think is interesting is that by doing the full genome sequencing of the virus, we've been able to show that there's been about 200 different uh, points where the virus came into the UK. So it's not just one person spreading it through the, the country, it's actually you know, multiple different introductions, um, again, from Europe, again, from China as well. Um, but i guess the bottom line is the virus isn't changing that much and it's certainly not as varied as flu so it's in some ways it's slightly limited at how we can trace it but by combining that with human movements the two the two things are important together tara's next question is quite a quite a challenging one have you concerns over the effectiveness of any vaccine trial in an environment in the uk where exposure to the virus is severely limited due to the effect of lockdown measures do you think it's morally appropriate in light of the pandemic crisis to purposely infect volunteers with COVID-19 to test any vaccine for its effectiveness? So this is a really good point, and this is being debated, I think, at extremely high levels of the world over at the moment, because you're absolutely right. As the cases of the virus go down in the UK, obviously great news, then the chances of somebody who's vaccinated being exposed to the virus fall. And this was actually a huge issue with the Ebola vaccines that went on because by the time the Ebola vaccines were developed for testing, suddenly the number of cases had fallen. So they never got to really tell, um, this is back in the 2014 outbreak, they never got to really tell how effective those particular vaccines were. Um, and so yes, the argument is, well, what if we can vaccinate healthy young individuals and then give them a dose of virus um, that potentially would make them sick mm -hmm. and that's what yeah that's it's a real difficult line because we know this virus can be deadly now there's probably ways that you could do this in a you know there would be very strict rules and regulations you would have to be i imagine have a very take your vaccine volunteers and do very strict health profiling you would want them to be most likely under the age of 30 um, and you would want to mitigate those risks as much as possible but i think they may they may well happen in certain situations these kind of challenge trials because that is you absolutely right that's the quickest way to get an answer mm. it's just is it fair to those volunteers mm. um so it's it's a difficult one but you you know saving lives is is what these vaccines are all about so it's going to be really sort of balancing up that pros and cons there thank you a question which I think you've, you've already touched on, um, and you might want to add something briefly. Is there a real concern of a second wave of infection after the UK lifts the lockdown in mid-June? I think it was something we will be keeping extremely close eye on. Um, I think, well, there's been some real geographical variation in the UK about how... Um, how common the virus is. I mean, again, here in Cambridge, we've been, we've been lucky. Um, we have we haven't seen sort of this crazy number of cases that some people were predicting um and we are as a city 
um, reasonably spread out. There isn't so much public transport. We cycle to work. So I think hopefully in this particular area, a second wave isn't going to be anywhere near as bad as the first wave but it's other cities where public transport is the only way to get to work where people have to be in much closer confinement I think that's that's going to be more of a concern. Thank you and here's a question from our colleague Nick Carroll um, who asks is there any hard evidence that antibody immunity is persistent and what's the relative contribution of antibodies and t-cell mediated immunity? Oh good questions okay um, so for other coronaviruses, so coronaviruses can cause colds in humans, just normal colds. Um, and we know that antibodies or protection against common colds doesn't really last that long. Um, it may be a, a year or two if we're lucky. So if we sort of make the bold assumption that this COVID-19 is quite similar to the other human coronaviruses, then we don't actually expect an immune response to last you know, for years, unlike things like measles, which an antibody response can protect you 50 years later. Um, but in respect to antibodies versus T cells, well, that's, that's a good point because T cells are a, another really important part of the immune response. Um, and they actually act to directly kill cells infected with the virus. So they are really important for virus control. Um, the issue we have is they're much harder to measure. <laughs> so I've, been, I've measured both in my research career and it's much easier to get a quick blood sample from someone to look for antibodies, whereas T cell activation is much more involved, you need much larger samples. So, I mean, obviously researchers are absolutely looking at both um, and it may be that we need to develop some more sophisticated tests to look to see whether your T cells are protective or not. Um, but I guess the holy grail is a very quick antibody test at the moment. There are two questions here which I'll put together because they come to the same thing really, um, really about the timing of our response. Someone asks, do you think that the UK acted too late in containing the virus as compared to other countries? Uh, Jonathan Lowe says in the Netherlands where I live and in the UK, there are many complaints that social distancing and lockdown did not happen earlier. How can you explain that we did not act? Yes, I mean, this is, again, verging into politics, which is certainly not something that I'm an expert in at all, but it's, um, I think it's fair to say that if lockdown had happened earlier, then we wouldn't have seen many, as many cases. I think that's that's safe to say. Um, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, the situation in Cambridge, we have been fortunate because um, it's generally been said we've been two weeks behind London. Um, geographically um, because again because of how I guess we are able to live in a smaller like more rural setting um, so I think locking down earlier would have certainly reduced the number of cases in London significantly um, and I yes I won't I won't start to touch on um, how achievable that would have been I mean it just it seemed to happen ever so quickly March before we knew it was essentially out of control it felt like to me and I'm sure it felt like to everybody out there as well and um, it, it was um, it's a difficult situation to try and you know tell a whole country to to not be moving around anymore it's 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 it's, it's completely unheard of um, so I very much hope many many lessons are being learned now I very much think that in the future we will be able to act faster people are going to take this much more seriously much more quickly as well so I think as a, as a nation um, I very much hope we will uh, respond to future incidents of which there are going to be some uh, we'll respond in a much more efficient way so I'm aware that our time is beginning to run out so um, I must apologize in advance to people whose questions won't make it to the top of the list. I'll try to get through two or three more before we close down, if that's all right with you all. Uh, and here's one which is a large one, but one I'm sure very important for an awful lot of our, our community, uh, from Peter Corston. What's the effect on children? Children, so what we seem to know at the moment is that children can get infected, but thankfully they just don't show the symptoms that adults do. Um, if we look at the, you know, the the really horrifying mortality statistics actually thankfully humans I mean sort of children just don't seem to get as sick uh, by any stretch of the imagination and that's that's obviously a, a fantastic thing um, but the worry is that if they're healthy but still having the virus they could spread it through the population and so that's why we've there's been these rules that have said you know children should not be 
visiting their grandparents or their elderly relatives because they may be um, what we call asymptomatic, which just means they're not showing signs of the virus. Um, so yes, there's obviously a big question about opening schools and things like that. And um, I think I think it is it is important to get um, these children back to school as safely as possible, and I and um, within a reasonable time frame for sort of the better of community and society and all the rest of it. But I think um, we do this very gradually and very carefully, and people need to be aware of all the the risks that that may go with it. And I think still distancing from um from grandparents i know it's it's horrendous but doing that for as long as possible has got to be the safest measure here thank you i think we can probably take two more questions um both of them are quite uh, technical but uh, but very interesting one from um muhammad ikwan aslan who asks on the macro level there seems to seem to be conflicting views among ep epidemiologists on the appropriate mathematical models to be employed as well as its interpretations which leads to confusion in our collective responses especially in light of the reopening of the economy and getting our institutions to return to some kind of normalcy could you enlighten us on the reasons for this that is on conflicting views on mathematical modeling um, so I guess I should st start by saying I'm, I'm certainly not a mathematical modeler. This is this is not something I've had much experience with. Um, but from what I understand, mathematical models are built on certain assumptions. Um, so uh, you know how how easily the virus spreads, how many people are susceptible, and even just slight tweaks to these to these numbers can massively change the outcome. So they're all essentially best guesses um, but everyone's best guess is going to be very slightly different um, and so it's I mean again for me as, as a virologist as opposed to an epidemiologist or modeler it's impossible for me to really say um, which of these is, is most accurate but again following all, all the data we're generating at the moment following this exact pandemic will feed into future models so I very much hope in the future we're going to get much more accurate predictors um, of, of outbreaks like this. Thank you. And I think the next will have to be the last question given that we're running out of time. This is from Jake Wadilov, who says, if we look at pigs, we see cross protection between the coronavirus's porcine respiratory cor coronavirus and transmissible gastroenteritis. Is there any chance of any cross protection from other human coronaviruses? Also, TGE is very UV light -like sensitive, is the COVID virus. Okay, good questions. Um, so cross protection, um, mm. um, we have seen that some people do seem to have antibodies um, against tiny parts of the COVID virus already without having been exposed to it. So there's clearly some level of, or cross reactivity is probably the best way to put it. Um, whether it's cross protections, whether the person's actually not going to get the infection or not, is a different matter and we can't actually say that with any um any confidence at the moment but um coronavirus as a whole they they are they are complex but there are going to be similarities between them so it would make sense that certain bits of the virus look a little bit similar we might generate a new response but we don't have any evidence that that's going to be useful at the moment um, in terms of the UV sensitivity, again, there's been a couple of studies that I think have looked to say, well, in, in maybe in warmer countries, you get slightly fewer cases, but it's not nothing's concrete at the moment. That's it seems very um, vague to me. Um, I mean, certainly in a lab, if you were to take the virus and shine a UV light on it, you would inactivate it, and that's a, a standard. Um, tool used by virologists to actually inactivate virus um, but whether whether the rays from the sun are sufficiently strong to do that I think is in doubt um, I don't think um, you judge by what wonderful weather we've had so far um, it's impossible to 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 really say oh that's the reason we're getting fewer cases I think it's, it's such a complicated system um, that I, I wouldn't put um, just being outside as because in the sunshine alone as the reason we're getting fewer cases. Well, um, sincere apologies to all those who did send in questions, and there are several more very interesting and very searching ones, but we did say we'd try and finish by, uh, by the hour. 
So um, it only remains really for me to say, Sarah, thank you so much for a really, really illuminating and clear discussion of all these very difficult issues. We, we are, I have to say, very proud as a college that we're making our little contribution through the skills of somebody like yourself. And we wish you all the very best in your research and your efforts in this era and your colleagues also. And it's uh, this is a delight and an honor to be able to bring out what you're doing and share it with our wider public here. Thank so, you, too kind. <laughs> and um, also thank you to all those um, well over a hundred who tuned in for this discussion. Thank you for a very, very challenging and very illuminating set of questions which you've sent in. Um, this seems to have worked reasonably well, so um, we look forward with some encouragement to trying it all over again in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and the next of these online webinars will be on the 18th of June, time to be confirmed, but that will be an event in which I'll be joined by Professor Eamon Duffy of this college and Fintan O'Toole, who is our visiting Parnell Fellow in Irish Studies this year at Magdalen and is a very, very well-known senior Irish journalist and writer, currently working on a biography of the poet Seamus Heaney. And he will be talking about his work on Seamus Heaney, his, Seamus Heaney's biographer, and it'll be connected with, we hope, um, an online presentation from Fintan on his uh, Seamus Heaney research in the next couple of weeks also. But you'll be very welcome on the 18th to join us for a discussion which will be in the same format as the one we've enjoyed today. You'll be welcome to send in questions to take part in the discussion. And once again, thank you to Sarah. Thank you to all those in the development office who helped to put together today's event. And thanks to all of you for your continuing solidarity with support of interest in what we do here in Magdalen. Thank you very much. And all the very best to all of you. Stay safe and well. Goodbye.